So good morning, everyone. Uh, I just like to welcome all of you all to uh, this uh, go-to-market strategy session for B2B startups organized by uh, NUS Enterprise together with uh, Hugh Mason. Um, and of course, uh, we are all not uh, strangers to Hugh. <laughs> he has been mentoring and helping out uh, NUS startups for quite a while. So he um, is the co-founder and CEO of JFDI which builds business ventures with entrepreneurs and enterprises, specializing in agile innovation to start and scale up joint ventures. Yeah, so yeah, so I just leave it. Uh, I, wish, I shall not butcher his past experience and I'll let him share a bit more about his experience with uh, you himself. So over to you, Hugh. Thank you very much. Um, let's just um, say hi to you for those of you who don't remember what I look like. Um, I hope that's... Uh showing me now. Um, I'm talking to you here from Red Hill and I'm wondering how many people we have on the line. I, I'm, as I'm looking at YouTube, I, I sorry, Zoom, I can't quite see. Well, you've got 15 people, so that's great. So I was trying to gauge the size because if it was sort of under 20, then I think there's an opportunity to have a conversation. If it gets to be more than sort of 20, then it's, it's harder to do that. So given that there's a fairly small number of us, um, if you want to um, interrupt at any time, please do. I'm, I'm going to talk in a series of sections through this presentation and um, do pop in with questions and, and we can change the emphasis as we go through. Okay, so I've got about an hour and a half, I believe. Um, and what I thought I'd do is talk for the first hour or so of that and then to try and move it into a dialogue and pick up on the things that you're most interested in. Okay, so let me try sharing my screen again and see if you're still seeing a presentation. Can I just confirm, uh, Yonkit, that you're seeing that presentation okay? Yep. Very good, okay. So let's get going. So in terms of introductions, a little bit of background on me. For those of you who don't know me, I'm a British originally. I've lived in Singapore for 12 years now. I'm a permanent resident. I live in an HDB. Um, my son went to local school, so fairly kind of localized. Um, I started my career as an engineer. I was sponsored through university by um, an electronics research company called GC Marconi. Um, at that part of time in my career, I thought I wanted to be an engineer. But actually, I realized that it was telling stories around innovation and, and technology that was uh, most of interest to me. So when I graduated, uh, shortly afterwards, I joined the BBC as a science TV producer. And I'm going to show you a couple of clips from some of the films I made um, uh, 25 years ago. Um, uh, which are all now on YouTube, which is which is great. People have posted them there, and uh, that feels like a real validation. Um, I've spent um, 25, 30 years being an entrepreneur ever since then. Um, first business was a TV production company. After that, I set up a business investing in all sorts of intellectual property-based companies in the UK. Um, I moved to Singapore in 2009 with my family, um, and many of you might know that I set up JFDI Asia with a colleague, Wang Meng Wang. That was the first startup accelerator in Southeast Asia. So we were trying to create a school for startups. So the thing I'm very interested in is how do people get ideas into action? How do they make innovation happen? Um, and I've done that with startups and I've done it with large organizations as well. And uh, I, I, since about 2006, uh, so to 2016, I've been teaching uh, part time at NUS. So I'm guessing that you're all business to business startups. Um, I'm hoping that that's the case. If there are B2C business to consumer startups watching this presentation, then I'm hoping that some of it will be useful to you. But I very much optimized it for the business to business uh, companies out there. And these are some of the challenges that many people recognize business to business companies face. It's quite hard to make a sale in business to business. It's hard to connect with potential customers. You know, you'll always be told by investors, tell me how big your market is, tell me, uh, you know, what, what's the opportunity here. That can be quite hard to assess. Um, when you're a new company trying to sell, particularly to larger companies, it's very hard when you've got no credibility, you've got no track record, you have no brand. Not just to sell to customers, but it can also be challenging to hire the, the talented people you need to scale your business. This is a particular killer. Um, if you're selling something to a corporation, a company might think about, a large enterprise might think about a purchasing decision over a year, 18 months, by which time you've run out of money and gone on and done something else. And, and by the time you've made your first sale, it's possible that technology has moved on and you may have had a great solution, but it may be that other technologies have taken over. So that's quite complex. And, and for the many of those reasons, a lot of business to business companies don't always just try to operate on their own. They often form partnerships and where you make alliances is, is, is really quite a, a critical decision. 
Now, the good news of having set out all those challenges is that I think here in Singapore, we can say that um, business to business startups seem to be successful. You know, at JFDI Asia, on the left hand side of this picture, you can see one of our demo days. Um, we had a mixture of business to consumer and business to business startups in the 70, uh, 70 companies that we invested in between 2011 and 2015. All the successful businesses are business to business, every single one of them. It was very interesting, you know, when we, when we set up in 2010, 2011, um, a lot of things were very different here in Singapore. There wasn't really a startup ecosystem. Uh, people like Professor Wong Po Kam had done huge amounts of work to create a, an angel network, but there wasn't really a community and there wasn't really um, a lot of methodology either. You know, lots of the words that we hear a lot nowadays, things like lean startup and so on. The book on lean startup was only written in 2012. So um, a lot of things have changed. Uh, I'd like to say it was a lot easier. <laughs> I don't think the challenge of launching a business to business startup has got easier, but I think what we can say now 10 years on is that some of the methods and, and, and also some of the dead ends are a lot clearer. The other good news is that we're starting to see the fruit of all that investment of time and energy and money and love and pain and sweat and tears. On the right hand side of the picture, you can see an announcement from one of our startups, um, Trade Gecko. It's a supply chain management system. So if you're a little company making specialized stuff somewhere in the world, a company that makes drill bits for oil rigs, or you make um, uh, electric guitars out of craft wood somewhere in New Zealand and you want to sell them to the world. One of the problems is it's very hard to understand how your inventory is working across um, global supply chains and, and Trade Gecko makes all of that easy. Um, the uh, the um, announcement here says that the deal closed uh, for about USD 80 million. Um, in fact, I, I can't tell you the exact figure, but I can tell you that's a significant underestimate. Um, the, the business was, um, uh, was uh, very successful. So be encouraged by that uh, and also be encouraged by the interest and support that the Singapore government is giving. You know, I think that I, when COVID-19 came along, my wife and I both had COVID-19. I, I was case number 729 and she was case 796, I think. And I was lying there in SGH in hospital thinking, I wonder what the government will do. I wonder if um, everyone will get super cautious and um, will stop investing in some of these things that feel a bit more risky, like deep technology and, and, and startups. Will we just go back to being kind of dormitory, dormitory for multinationals. And actually the government hasn't done that. The significant investment here into business to business startups in particular. Um, and, um, and the key to making a return on that for us as a nation is that we get companies through this kind of funnel. The picture on the right hand side shows the typical kind of rounds of funding that startups go to on the way to either launching on a stock exchange or, or, or exiting. Many, several rounds are typical. And here's uh, from CB Insights, uh, an indication of the number of companies that make it through to, to each round. Now, there's a much longer discussion about whether the ones that don't make it are successes or failures, and, and that's a, a discussion for another day. But if we're going to create a return on the kind of scale that uh, Singapore needs, then we do need to make it down that funnel. One of the things to look at when you're thinking about, well, how do I succeed is how can I avoid failure? Uh, and I think what's interesting is as you look at um, you know, the reasons that startups fail, not just deep technology startups, but I've, I've sorted the sort of 20 factors that CB Insights, one of the great uh, databases on startups, uh, has come up with. I've sorted the 20 top reasons they came out with into factors that seem to me to be related to marketing and factors that are unrelated to marketing. And the majority of them seem to be, to me, quite closely related to marketing. And I think you can see why in a moment. Now, I don't know how many of the startups here, we, we didn't know who was going to come to this presentation. It could be that some of you uh, are working with deep technology. Your company is very much built around a novel technology. Um, if that's the case, there are some additional challenges that you face. Um, and, um, uh, and we can come back and explore those in more detail later on. But as I don't know what the mix is at the moment, let's talk generically for, for most of this presentation. Okay, so what do we mean by a go-to-market strategy? Well. Going to market is something that you do when you're doing an innovation. Um, for those of you who aren't familiar with the sort of definitions of innovation, there are many out there, but one of the ways of thinking of it is that creativity is the human ability to come up with new things. Invention is what we do when we create something. But just because we've created something and it's cute and all our friends say it's great, 
that doesn't mean it's actually going to translate into something that creates value for the world. So innovation is often defined as a process. It's the taking of something into a marketplace that in a way that creates value, something new coming into a marketplace that creates value. So that could be taking an innovation that already exists in one market and moving it into another market, or it could be coming up with something completely new. But if you're gonna do innovation and it's gonna succeed, then I think a lot of people would say it has to sort of hit these three buttons at once. Uh, obviously, the technology's got to work. If, if, you're, if you're not doing something that, that doesn't work, then you're doing science fiction. But that's only one third of the whole success picture here. Two thirds of getting to success, producing something that's a viable business which generates value and creating something that people actually want. That's all about going to market. That's two thirds of success. So I think sometimes, particularly for technology-based entrepreneurs who come from a tech background, at the start of an innovation when you're creating something that genuinely is based around new technology, it's very easy to forget about all this other stuff. But it is critical if you're going to succeed as a business. So what do I mean by strategy? Um, I'm not gonna go into this in any depth. What I will say for those of you who've explored it on Google is strategy, leadership, and change are the three most popular kind of topics for business books. There are thousands upon thousands of books written on this topic. Um, this is the definition of strategy I'm going to use, a plan of action designed to achieve a long-term or overall aim. So while I will touch on some of the sort of nuts and bolts, the tactics of going to market in the last part of this presentation, um, I want to talk about the big picture, most of this, about the, uh, adapting, uh, adopting a long-term strategy. If you're interested in strategy, I can't recommend this book highly enough. It's, one, it's the only business book I've ever read which made me laugh. Um, it's, um, Henry Mintzberg is quite an entertaining writer, and he basically looks at the ways that different people have struggled to understand how do we do long-term planning and actually make stuff happen over the last sort of 100, 150 years. And it's quite surprising when you read it through. We, we take for granted, for example, in our time, that entrepreneurship, you know, and an entrepreneurial sort of strategy is a great way to go. That would have seemed very strange to people in the 1950s. Um, and uh, I'll let you read the book to find out why. So what do we mean by startups? On the left-hand side of it, for those of you again who haven't seen a definition, this is Professor Steve Blank at Stanford's definition of a startup, a temporary organization formed to search for a repeatable and scalable business model. Temporary is the key word there. Um, I don't know if anyone else listening to this is a parent. I love my son, he's 14. Um, uh, and I have to say, if we could have kind of skipped through the first two or three years of, of having a baby, for me, I, I much more enjoyed the point when he was able to talk and walk and I could start doing things with him. There's a period with a sort of startup human being that you have to go through if you want to have children, <laughs> but it is quite tiring. The first thousand days for anyone who hasn't tried it is really quite intense. And I think the same is true perhaps for a business, you know, that the, a startup is, a, is not something that you should aspire to do forever. It's something that's a means to an end. It's part of a journey. And this picture here suggests some ways you can think about that. At the bottom of the picture, we've got businesses which are not really being grown with any intention of, of, of becoming large or scalable. At the top, we've got very ambitious businesses. On the left-hand side, we've got business models that we really haven't proved yet. And on the right-hand side, they're very proved. So when you have a startup, as we define it here in Singapore, I think we're talking about people who have ambition to create something that has impact, however you define that. And what we're trying to do is get to be a scale up, right? The objective is not to stay a startup as quickly as possible to get to scaling up. What Singapore and investors don't want to fund particularly is small businesses. Nothing wrong with small businesses. The majority of people in Singapore are employed by small businesses between sort of five and 10 people. They're the backbone of the economy. I admire everyone who runs a hawker stall. I admire everyone who runs a small graphic design company or a legal practice. But these, these things are essential. But they don't scale up and create wealth and opportunity for the future in the way that scale ups do. So what we're all interested in from investors' point of view, from um, uh, your talented staff who are interested in part of being, being part of the next big thing, we're all interested in getting to being a scale up. So how do you do that? Well, you have to go through something that Paul Graham at Y Combinator calls the, the trough of sorrow. This is a picture sort of trying to summarize 
how it feels to run a startup. And if anyone watching this is somewhere on this journey, I mean, you might find yourself chuckling. Um, if this is happiness over here and this is sort of sadness, you know, you, you get together, you get hugely inspired. You think you're, whoops, you think you're going to conquer the world. And then it turns out to be a lot harder and not just a lot harder. It's really, really hard. And then someone leaves the team and goes back to working in whatever they were doing before. And then the technology starts working and customers start replying to conversations, but they're not actually buying yet. And then finally, you get to this fabulous point called product market fit, which is when life changes and then you start to become a scale up. So what is product market fit? For anyone who's interested, um, I, put a, I put some links here in a PDF, which you're all welcome to have a PDF of these slides. Um, I've put some uh, um, hot links here into some, uh, uh, well, you can click through to, to some background on, on this. But this is a summary of one way of thinking about what, what a product market fit feels like. So I won't dive into that into huge depth, but a key thing about it is that you, you will notice that moment when you get to product market fit, you'll notice that suddenly the business is working. Just to be clear about go-to-market strategy, um, it's quite different for startups and scale-ups. In the startup phase, you're trying to figure out, do I have a business model? Do I have something that people want? You've got to go to the market because without going to the market, you can't answer that question. Once you've got product market fit, you still need to go to the market. You just need to go to it in a different way. So in this presentation, I'm going to focus most on this end. And that's based on the assumption that we were going to have mostly startups on this on this webinar. Again, we weren't sure in advance, but that seemed to be the indication that it was mostly startups who were signing up. So I'm going to focus on this part of the journey rather than this part of the journey. There's a shift in culture in a business that happens often about two or three years into the business if you're successful. It often happens about the time that you raise your second round of funny of money for funny of money. Um, often that funding comes from a venture capital firm or some other kind of institutional investor, suddenly the business moves from being a kind of startup where you're making it up as you go along and exploring what works into something that starts to feel a bit more grown up. Um, and, and, and different people are interested and good at different stages of that journey and they're both valuable. It's not like one's good and one's bad. Without the startup phase, we would have no scale ups. You know, every single large company in the world started as a startup at some point. <clears throat> and even though most business schools for most of the 20th century uh, and most of the people with fancy sounding titles tend to work in larger businesses, don't forget if you're an entrepreneur that without the entrepreneurs, none of them would have a job. So I'm not going to go into this diagram in any great depth, but I just wanted to put it up to give a sense of the sort of landscape of tools that lie around. I mentioned that in 2010, 2011, when Meng and I were setting up JFDI Asia, there wasn't so much of a toolkit sort of lying around to build startups. And here are some of the kind of buzzwords that I'm sure you've heard of. You've probably heard of design thinking. You've probably heard of lean startup. You might have heard of things like agile methods. Um, this horribly complicated picture from Gartner is supposed to try and make everything seem simple. Um, I think I, I say it's a heroic effort to try and connect together a set of three sort of philosophies for, for, for um, uh, um, going to market and achieving a product that works. I'm going to summarize it by saying that my view of design thinking is it's a fantastic way to diverge and explore a an lot of opportunities and create opportunities. I think lean startup is very good for narrowing down on what's actually working. And then I think agile techniques are very good for optimizing. Imagine that you're trying to find the world's highest mountain and then climb it and then open a holiday resort at the top. Okay, maybe not a great idea. To find the world's highest mountain, the biggest opportunity, you need to go searching over a wide area and you need to use something like design thinking to do that. Once you've found your mountain, Lean Startup will let you find a way to the top. Agile will let you optimize that way to the top and optimize a, a business and a product around it. So this concept of product market fit is, is not one moment. It's something that happens over a period. And I think that matters again, particularly, I don't know to say how many deep technology startups we've got on this call. 
But I think that's really important in the context of technology-based businesses, because when you start up a technology-based businesses, all of the battles seem to be technical. Those seem to be the main issues, just making the thing work and putting it all together. There's a lot of work to do around making it, putting it all together and making it work. As you get towards product market fit, the emphasis changes. Of course, you need to keep working on the technology. You need to keep improving it. You need to keep staying ahead of the competition. But it comes more important at that stage to be building the business. You can't build the business until the technology works, but you can't know what technology to build until you started building the business. So you need to do those things in parallel. These are some signs here for product market fit. And again, I'll let you look at, um, uh, at Rechewski's um, writing on that if you're interested in more detail of it. These are the kinds of signals that you'll get that you're approaching product market fit. If you've got a business to business product or service that people are visibly excited about, they're retweeting what you send out on social media, they're liking it, they're asking to meet, they're asking for presentations, they're asking for demos, that is a very good sign. If somebody is willing to give you cash now, for something that you're still developing, that's a very good sign that you're close to product market fit. If nobody will give you any money, no one's prepared to share the journey with you, and no one cares, then that's a sign that you're still a long way away from product market fit. It doesn't mean give up, but it does mean you're not anywhere near product market fit yet. Once you're into the kind of scale up stage, then the kinds of things that you need to know are, if a customer bought from you once, are they staying with you? Um, what kind of feedback are they giving to you and also to the market? Are you finding that without spending huge amounts of money on advertising, the business is actually is, is, is growing of its own accord? Um, I won't go through all of these, but a classic one here would be, is the long-term value that you extract from a customer higher than the cost of acquiring that customer? So for every $10 you spend on acquiring a customer, you need to be capturing not just in revenue, you need to be capturing in terms of profit, long-term value that exceeds the cost of customer acquisition. That won't happen over here as a startup, but it should start happening when you're a scale up. Okay, so that's enough about product market fit in an abstract terms. I just want to put it in context by telling a story about a real business. Um, Silent Eight is a company that went through JFDI Asia in 2014, I think, something like that. It's a husband and wife team. They're both Polish, um, uh, and you can see them in the picture there. They had an idea, having worked in a corporate environment, that when you're working in a large organization, there is data sprinkled around in all sorts of databases. It's buried in email attachments. It's buried in old legacy Oracle databases and whatnot. And if you're in a large organization, particularly if you're new to that company, it's very hard to find things. So what they created was a kind of Google for enterprises, a cross-platform search engine that let you find information wherever it was buried using whatever technology and, and pull it up on screen, just like, just like Google. And their idea was that they would sell this with a subscription to uh, large companies, maybe, I don't know, $20 a year for each user, something like that. And people were kind of interested in that. Yeah, well, could be useful. That could be quite helpful. But they kept pushing and pushing because it was clear that they'd got some interest, but there wasn't really product market fit. And when they focused on banks and know your customer, the issue of understanding what interactions have we had previously with this customer and what other data can we get on this customer to know whether they're a genuine person or whether there was financial crime going on, fraud, that sort of thing, misrepresentation, money laundering. That is a huge problem in banks. And it was taking banks something like three hours manually to search all their databases to, to answer this question, can I, should I be doing business with this new customer? Um, Silent8 has reduced that to 30 seconds for 80 to 90% of cases. It comes up with a confidence interval. It's search is still doing search, but it's doing it in a very narrow domain, in the domain of knowing customers when they first come to a bank. And the reason that it works is it hits three hot buttons inside every business. If you want to sell businesses, the three golden things, if you can possibly do them, are help them save money, right? Because they haven't have, got to have lots of people hanging, uh, sitting around doing this manually. Help them make money by offering a better experience to customers. And help them comply with regulation. So save money, make money, fix compliance. If you're selling any product into a business, often those are three things. If you can hit two out of three of those things, um, you'll definitely get the door opening to you. Okay, 
So that's an abstract uh, kind of uh, discussion. I'm just going to ask whether anyone has any questions at this moment before I dive into the next section. Does anyone want to ask any questions about that? About what go-to-market actually is? No? Okay. Um, then let's go diving in again. And what I'm going to look at now is go-to-market, but which market? And that might sound like an obvious question, but it isn't. Let me show you why. There's a film I made in 1993, and I want to show you a little clip from it. It's about five minutes long, but I think it's worth watching. So let me show you this. In the popular Hall of Fame, Alexander Graham Bell stands with Edison as a truly heroic inventor. The accolade is justified. While it's hard for us to imagine life without the telephone, in the 1870s, Bell's foresight was extraordinary. It was by no means, it seems to me, obvious at that time that it was really important for two people to be able to speak to one another over wire. Uh, I think it's obvious in hindsight. And I'm not saying that without Alexander Graham Bell, there never would have been a device to transmit speech. But it might have happened some years later. It might have taken on a very different character than it does now. This seems an extraordinary claim. But in the 1870s, the telephone was just one amongst many wonders of the age. In the early days, America was very wide and very big, so they had lecture halls and they had people traveling around the country demonstrating the latest technology in America. And they paid 25 cents just to come and hear somebody talk. Testing one, two, three, four. Mary had a little lamb. It's fleets as white as snow. And everywhere that Mary went, the lamb was sure to go. It was just magic to hear the human voice come from a piece of steel. People gathered from all over the United States to hear these lectures take place. To the public, Bell, too, was a technological wizard. At that time, Bell's telephone did not work very well. One of the tricks that they would use is they would shout familiar quotations from Shakespeare or from a popular song. They'd sing a popular song so that people could fill in the gaps when the transmission wasn't very clear. Bell is a showman in this sense. He can go out on the road with Tom Watson, his redoubtable and very famous assistant, and they can be, let's say, eight miles apart. And Watson by then has gotten so used to using the, the telephone that he can shout into it, cup his hands, project his voice, focus it just right so everyone in the lecture hall can hear the human voice coming out of this little tiny device up there on the platform. And Bell can do the same thing, going back and forth. And they have a marvelous effect on people. People are just amazed to hear the human voice coming out of this simple little device. We were kind of proud, the Americans, that this is going to bring the world together, even the United States together. People in the country can talk to people in the city. This latest technology was just so exciting in the, in the 1850s and 60s and stuff like that, and 80s. Exciting, but not at first sight essential. The early telephones were not seen as a threat to the existing communication system. The Morse telegraph used a key to send a long or short pulse of electricity down a wire different combinations of long and short pulses for different letters of the alphabet. At the receiving station, a sounder clicked away with the message, or it was recorded onto paper tape. By the 1870s, telegraph wires were going up all over America, but the number of messages was growing even faster. What the telegraph industry needed was a technology to send several messages over the same wire. Its inventor would be richly rewarded. Edison and Bell both raced towards that goal. Edison won, but in doing so, he missed out on the invention which would ultimately replace the telegraph altogether. 
In Washington's Library of Congress, there is a clue to why Bell, not Edison, went on to invent the telephone. The thing that's unique and different about Alexander Graham Bell, and I, I think is the main reason why he is the inventor of the telephone, is uh, he had an extensive background in teaching and working with the deaf. Bell didn't know much about electricity, but he had studied anatomy. He understood how the human ear picks up sound waves from the air. The ear uses a diaphragm to transform the sound waves into vibrations which are carried by tiny bones in the middle ear. But he also had a deeper, personal inspiration. Bell's wife was one of his students, a deaf student, and he fell very much in love with her and wanted to also make his way in the world and make fame and fortune. He didn't want to just be a teacher of the deaf. He, he felt that he could invent something unique and wonderful that would uh, set him up and set up his new wife for life. Bell knew what an impoverished world deaf people lived in, and I think that's why he became uniquely obsessed. Bell's obsession was the transmission of speech. If you're in the telegraph industry, and along comes the telephone in 1876, 1877, you're going to look at it and you're going to say, there are two things that, that concern me about this. First is, everything has been devoted towards getting two, four, or more messages on a single wire. The telephone comes along, and that's only going to be able to allow one person in New York to speak to one person on the same wire in Chicago. And so it's a poor use of resources from a technical or economic standpoint. It's also puzzling because the telegraph, which has 40 years of tradition already set down, is by no means a personal technology. And that means that when you look at the telephone, which real strength is for person-to-person -person communications, it doesn't make any sense. Why would you want something that, that is that personal and, and doesn't really make good use of, of the existing public Public and what he says is the existing public wires. And I think that's interesting because, you know, we take for granted telephones nowadays, um, but it isn't at all obvious that they were going to be a successful technology. On the right hand side here, I've got some adoption curves for different technologies. This is starting at the year they were launched, and it shows you the time that it took for them to get to significant adoption. The telephone here is this purple line. And if you look, to get to 50% of American households having a telephone took 70 years. 70 years. Right. Just to get this graph off the bottom of the page here took about 25 years. Now, all that time, Bell wasn't making any money. People were pouring money into this technology. They were educating the public about the idea that being able to speak to each other down a wire was a good idea. And they were fighting lots of other assumptions. I mean, it, it wasn't at all obvious to people at the end of the 19th century. Why would you want a machine in your house which could be rung up at any time by strangers and then a bell would go and you'd have to stop what you were doing with your family and you'd have to go and pick up this thing and answer the call. I mean, obviously they didn't have voicemail. It wasn't at all obvious why you would want this telephone thing. It was very expensive. You know? What I'm going to do now is I'm going to take you through the exercise. Imagine that you were launching the telephone and you were going through an exercise to understand which market to launch it into. So, you can do this exercise with whatever your business uh, does. Start off by listing the features of the technology that you use. In the case of the telephone, here are some of them. Obviously, it transmits sounds, but as the historians of technology were just saying, a key defining thing about it is it's very private and very intimate. You don't have to write a, a message and then hand it to a telegraph clerk who reads you know, your love letter to your, your husband or your wife. It's very private. You, you speak directly to the person. It works across the distance. This is a good thing. It doesn't require any skill. Sending and receiving Morse code requires a lot of training. Telephone requires hardly any skill at all. And it's completely instantaneous. You don't have to go to the telegraph station, fill out a form, hand it over, you know, and then a, a later on in the day, maybe the telegraph boy will cycle to your house with a reply. It's instantaneous. So those all sound quite cool. In practice, what benefits does that make possible? Well, obviously, you can share speech over the telephone, but you can send other sounds as well. You can send music. Because you can have speech and it's two-way, you can actually have a conversation. It's not like radio where it just goes in one direction. It, it's a two-way thing. There is a conversation possible. It's possible to share not just facts in a way that it's easy to do in a, a, tele, a telegram message or an email, but it's also emotion. You, you get much more of a sense talking to someone of how they're feeling. 
So in every sense, you can stay connected with people across a distance. Uh, and, um, uh, and, you know, it has all of those kinds of benefits. Now, where might you apply something that has those benefits? I've now gone back to say, let's rub out the features and let's instead look at different use cases. If I'm going to kind of stay in touch and chat with friends, obviously I've got to be able to convey speech. I want to have conversations with them. These are the things I want to do if I'm talking with a friend. If I'm coordinating my business, I've again got to be able to do pretty much the same thing. Actually, even sharing emotion is important in business. If you're trying to make a decision about whether to buy another company or to hire a person, sharing emotions with colleagues is quite important. Now, you could use the telephone, and people used to use the telephone for sharing entertainment. Now, one of the first applications suggested for the telephone was actually listening to opera at a distance. People thought of it as a sort of broadcasting technology, you know, where again, you might be part or, or sports matches. You know, remember, this is a time long before radio. It was even suggested that you could, you know, instead of sending a servant to go to the, the shops to go and buy some food, you could, you could phone up um, the, the butcher's shop and have them send over some meat or, or groceries or whatever you like. And this was a critical thing at a time when people were just starting to realize that having accurate time was important. You know, if you're going to go to the railway station and catch a train, you need to know that your clock at home is set accurately. For the first time ever, you, you, could, you could find out what the time was accurately. Um, so if you've got those possible markets, where, sorry, if you've got those possible use cases, which markets might those be strongest in? Well, in the domestic markets, that's obviously where you're going to be talking to family and friends. Business coordination happens in offices and factories, but it also happens in situations like the military. You know, if you've got people firing an artillery weapon, you've got someone up on a hill with a pair of binoculars spotting where is the shells landing, and having a telephone to be able to call back immediately in the middle of a battle and tell the gunners where to point the gun, you know, up a bit, left a bit, down a bit, that, that would be a fantastic application. And if you're trying to coordinate a transport network, obviously you've got to do that too. I mentioned Opera here as being one of the applications where you could share entertainment. And if you're going to do shopping from home, that would obviously affect businesses and it would affect domestic markets as well. Actually knowing the time would be useful to a lot of people. Now let's look at within those markets, which of them is the most useful one to focus on at first? What would be your beachhead market for anyone who's, um, uh, done their NS, you'll, you'll know that concept. If you're going to invade a country, you need to establish a beachhead. You land at the shores of the country and go over the beach, literally, and you need to win a piece of territory. That's the beachhead. Where do you begin? And one of the things I suggest with every company that's looking at thinking, well, where should I go to market? Which market should I approach? Is that you just score things like this with one, two, three, four, or maybe five ticks. Don't make it too sophisticated. Try and understand for each of the markets you're looking at, how big is that market? You know, if we did get really active in this, is it one we're gonna make a lot of money in? Is it easy to reach customers? And that by, by that I mean, is it easy to identify who actually has got money and then is it easy to get through to them? You know, one of the advantages of a business to business innovation rather than a business to consumer one is that often groups of businesses are very well defined. If you've invented something that's just right for um, beauty spas, you can go on Google and you can very easily put together a list of all the beauty spas in Singapore and Malaysia and Philippines and Vietnam. Business to, businesses tend to be very visible. Where it's difficult with businesses is trying to identify within the business, who do I need to talk to? Who would actually be the customer? So if I'm going to sell to spas, is it the business owner? Is it the shift manager inside it? Is it the masseurs? Who's it going to be inside the spa that I sell to? So is it going to be easy to reach the person who's actually going to make a decision and write you a check? When you do reach that person, do they have an urgent need? You know, are they biting your hand off to, to try and get some new solution in? And will it be quick to apply whatever solution you've got to that particular market? So I've scored these things here based on my guess as what it would have felt like in about the 1880s to try and sell the telephone. I think it would have been quite difficult in the domestic market to sell it, because although there are lots of homes, huge number of homes, you'd have to wire them up all individually and there aren't many people in the home and they wouldn't use the phone that often. So there are some reasons why you wouldn't do domestic telephones straight away. But there are some reasons why you do offices, because there's a lot of people who hopefully have a lot of messages focused in an office. 
And often they're right next door to a factory and they might need to communicate with the factory, for example, and there might be a reason to communicate quickly between a warehouse and a, an office, something like that. Military applications, definitely. Uh, very, um, you know, potentially the military will pay a lot of money for something and uh, certainly in terms of uh, being able to separate a person who is spotting where artillery shells are landing from a, an artillery piece, that's a hugely important need which is not solvable really by any other method other than having a running messenger. So military, there's some urgent needs, but on the other hand, is it a huge market? Not really. Is it easy to get in? No, it's going to be hard to sell to the army probably. And is it going to be quick to deploy? Maybe, maybe not. So anyway, I've gone down all of those things and I suggest if you did something like this for your business, when you, when you score it this way, you'll find that one market has got fairly obviously the most ticks and that's the one to pick to focus on. Now, once you've got your beachhead market, once you've decided which market you want to go to, and I've said only one, because as a small startup, you've got limited resources. If you try to service two or three different markets and explore two or three things at once, it's like a tiny country trying to fight a war on three fronts. You'll never do it. You'll just split your energy. Much better to focus on one market, do it really, really well, and then expand outwards from there. Once you're into the beachhead market, however, you still have to be very open-minded. And I wanted to tell you a little bit more detail about um, this company, Trade Gecko, I mentioned earlier on to illustrate how they did this. So the story of Trade Gecko begins with this guy, really, Carl Thompson. Um, Carl is a, a, a fashion designer by background. He created a whole range of sort of um, high-end t-shirts in New Zealand, and they were selling really well. They had a brand and they had products and they were selling them to shops all around New Zealand and the company blew up and failed. And the reason it failed is because they hadn't got a system to control distribution. They would make t-shirts, the designs that Carl thought would work, and he had very good taste for that. But when they tried to sell them to multiple shops all around, um, all around New Zealand, people would um, um, could get confused about the, the type of t-shirt they were ordering. They put the wrong number on a form. Sometimes they'd fax in orders or they'd email them or they'd kind of phone them up. So information was coming at the company from all different directions. And the bigger the company got, the more successful it was, the more the problem of distributing the t-shirts became. And in particular, um, there was an issue with traveling salespeople who would go to a shop in New Zealand and say, hey, we've got these cool, cool new t-shirts. Which ones do you want? And if the person in the shop said, oh, that's great, I want 100 of those, the person selling them right there and then would not know, do we have 100 of those in the warehouse? Or if this person is asking for them next week, can I deliver them right now? I don't know. So the very first concept that Carl and his, co-founder, his co-founders had was let's create a sales tool that lets people know whether we've got stuff in stock or not. And so they started, when they came to our JFDI accelerator program, we talked to them about Lean Startup and all that. Uh, They began doing customer discovery. They used to come in at four o'clock in the morning, every morning, so that they could start phoning around different markets around the world to understand how did customers think, what problems were customers facing. And very quickly, they they hit a brick wall. They were talking to sales managers, people who've got sales teams working underneath them. And they found that the sales team, the sales managers generally thought that their sales staff already had plenty of technology and their sales staff were basically just lazy and that they weren't going to spend any more money on sales technology. However, when they spoke to chief financial officers in companies that were trying to sell around the world, they came across a related problem, which was that the chief financial officers were trying to manage how much stock have we got tied up, how much money have we got tied up in stock in inventory in warehouses around the world. If I'm making the wrong things in the factory and I'm building up a stock of 500 t-shirts of this kind or 500 electric guitars of that kind, and actually it's a different kind that's selling, then I've got money that's it's going to take a very long time to get back out of the warehouse. So inventory management related to this turned out to be the beachhead market for them. Later, two or three years later, they did end up being building the original sales tool that they thought of. But the core of the business turned out to be in distribution, and managing inventory. And to this day, that's what Trade Gecko is. It plugs into a load of other bits of software like Shopify and things, and, and it was sold to, to Intuit just uh, uh, last month. Okay, I'm gonna have another quick break there to see whether anyone has any questions. I'm gonna come back to you. Um, and I'm, I haven't been able to read the chat, by the way, as we're going, I see there's some messages in chat here. Should we pick up questions from here? 
thank you, um, Jan Kit, for suggesting people put the questions there. So any particular factors to look for in hiring talent? Um, let's, yes, let's come back to that when I talk about that in the last section of this. Thank you very much, Ivan, for that question. Um, scale up is expanding overseas. Do I have to repeat? Yes, you do. Thank you very much, Dion, for raising that point. Uh, you know, I mentioned that innovation is about introducing something new to a market. When you are moving from one market to another market, you don't have to repeat the entire process all over again. I mean, hopefully you've got some technology that works and things like that. But you do need to do all the testing, all the validation over again. And I think a lot of people underestimate that. And they also, the difficulty of going into a second market is often that you have a lot of expectations from your first market about, oh, this is how people behave, this is what they think, this is what they say. And especially if you're dealing with a different culture, um, actually that can be that can be very different. Often the beachhead market may be filled with many competitors. Should there be a consideration when choosing the beachhead product? Uh, thank you, um, uh, Ju Chiu An. Yeah, absolutely, it should be. So, do you remember in my list of factors for scoring the market, um, I said, you know, is there an urgent need? And I think you could say, is there an urgent and sort of unsatisfied need? Maybe I should have put the word unsatisfied there as well. If you're trying to establish if you're trying to get into a beachhead market where there are already lots of competitors, it's going to be extremely difficult. Uh, it's going to be very hard to get visibility. It's going to be very hard to make those first few sales that are going to get you the revenue to convince investors to back you, to give everyone confidence that the company is working. So try to find an area where there is an urgent, unsatisfied need as your beachhead market. It may not be the biggest market ever, but if it's a market that lets you get established, build your credentials, prove what you can do, then that might still be the best market to go for. So thank you very much. Those are great questions. I really appreciate them. Let me go back to sharing the screen again, and I'll carry on. So I want to dive now into sort of the thing that happens, if you're lucky, when you have gone to market, which is hopefully people start buying from you. And I want you to go into a little bit of detail on, you know, what is it that, what is it that businesses do when they buy? because I think it's not actually that, that obvious. Let's go here, whoops. And to give you an example of this, I want to show you another little video. This is from 1959, and it's the very first commercial ever for a photocopier. Oops, and I clicked in the wrong place. Let's try here. Debbie, will you please go make a copy of this? Okay, Daddy. That's my secretary. Which is the original? I forget it! You've just seen the Xerox 914 copier. It makes your first copy in less than a minute. Seven copies a minute after that. The 914 makes copies on ordinary paper automatically. For the name and number of your nearest Xerox office, look in your telephone book. So, for those of you who don't know, Xerox was the kind of Google of its day. Um, this business grew through the 1960s and 1970s, from about 40% year-on-year compounded growth. It was absolutely enormous. Xerox dominated um, paper handling in offices through the 60s and 70s and 80s. It blew it all later on. Uh, that's another story. But I wanted to show you that advert because I think it captures much of the challenge of trying to introduce a new technology to a market. Now, many of you, particularly the younger people who are watching this, may not remember how dominant photocopiers used to be. When I was a student, there was a huge queue in the library at the university always to use the photocopier we had, because everything was based on paper. But in the 1950s, when people uh, first encountered photocopiers, most organizations didn't need to copy things very often. 
they would make perhaps a few hundred copies um, a month if you're a large enterprise, and you would do it typically by photographing a um, by photographing um, a document, and then you would literally print photographs in a, in a wet chemical laboratory. Xerox spent about 20 years commercializing this technology. There were about 400 patents required before the Xerox 914 copier could be produced. Once they'd done all that, they found it very difficult to find someone to distribute it. They took it to IBM, the biggest office equipment company at the time, and IBM said, well, you know, companies don't make that many photocopies. They can set up a dark room, a conventional photographic dark room for a few hundred dollars, and this thing costs $25,000, $30,000 for each machine. So why on earth is anyone ever going to buy that? So the second huge innovation that Xerox made was a business model innovation. They came up with a business model that we now know and we use with things like um, mobile phones. You're sold a certain number of units and you sold so many SMSs each month, so many minutes of call time. The bet that Xerox took was that people would so enjoy making photocopiers that they would quickly run through the thousand photocopies that came as part of the, the monthly leasing price. So you could lease a photocopier for a few hundred dollars a month. And once you'd burned through that first thousand copies, then it was an extra 10 cents, 20 cents, whatever for every copy. And they, they figured that this would become addictive within large organizations and they were absolutely right. And as I say, Xerox ended up building a, an enormous, at the time, world beating company through two things, technology innovation, but also business model innovation. But what wasn't obvious at all when they launched it, that that technology was something that businesses actually required. And I like that advert because, you know, without any, without many words, it basically says, this thing is so easy to use, even a child can do it. And by the way, it empowers your creativity, you know, the way she photocopies her toy. And then at the end, the other third key message is, and by the way, the copies are so good, you can't tell which is the original. So in that little story, it tells you the three things that ultimately did turn out to be the breakthrough benefits that, that, that made businesses adopt photocopying in, in huge quantities. Okay, let's move on and try and generalize from that. There's a lovely picture here uh, from Chris Dixon who works at uh, uh, one of the big venture capital firms in, 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 in the US. He points out that like the Xerox photocopier, the things that turn out to be absolutely brilliant busy B2B innovations initially look bad, <laughs> but turn out to be very good. But this is important because most people in most businesses all adopt the obviously good ideas and they believe that they're paid to eliminate the bad ideas. So most people in business, when you introduce something new, unless they can see that something is obviously brilliantly good, they won't do it because they might be fired. Right? The trouble is that the stuff that actually changes the world starts out looking bad and actually turns out to be very good. This is a picture that I think puts that in more context, for anyone who hasn't seen it before, uh, it's called the Three Horizons of Innovation. It's drawn in several different ways, but I've, I've done a kind of a, a, my version of it here. On the bottom axis, we've got technology going from established yesterday's technology through the thing that everyone's talking about through to stuff that's still you know, in the lab. And then on this axis, I've got within the company things that we already do, business models that we already use, markets that we're already selling into. Here are the things adjacent to that, and here's stuff that we haven't even explored yet. So let me give you an example. Imagine you're an ice cream company in Singapore. If you sell vanilla ice cream, and you think, oh, actually, we could do durian ice cream as well, or we could do Nazi Lamax flavored ice cream, whatever, that would be the next big thing. But doing cheesecake or doing selling T-shirts alongside your ice cream, that would be um, a completely different area of business. And doing ice cream, which is delivered by drone, that would be a completely new technology. So if I take my Singapore-based ice cream company that sells vanilla ice cream, if I move into selling ice cream into Malaysia, but I still do it pretty much in the same way I used to, I've got shops that sell ice cream, that's into an adjacent market with a very similar business model. But I could sell ice cream um, that uh, is sold as a gift and it's delivered um, uh, three years into the future, I could buy a lifetime subscription for my wife so that every year on her birthday, I pay one chunk of money now and she gets ice cream for the rest of her life, right? That would be a brand new business model, not new technology, but a brand new business model. So every kind of new innovation tends to fall somewhere on this picture. And if I take some examples of some of the things that we've talked about, telephones and photocopiers, they all started off seeming like science fiction. 
and then they became normal and finally they become something that we stop using. This is a picture of what fax machines looked like in the 1940s and 50s. I remember my dad telling me in the 1970s that his company had a fax machine. I, I think it was probably slightly more up to date than that. In Britain, what happened was in the 1980s, um, the postal workers went on strike at precisely the same time that cheap fax machines became available from uh, companies in Japan. And everybody got a fax machine. We used to have one at home even. And nowadays, of course, most of us don't use fax machines at all. They're something that's still used in hospitals and people like architects might use them if they've got pencil drawings they want to fax, but, but it's fairly uncommon. So technologies tend to make a journey from top right to bottom left in this picture. And the reason why people buy these things varies depending on which of those horizons you're at. If you're down in the bottom left-hand corner, you're in what we call horizon one, using yesterday's technology to do things that we already do. The main reason that people buy things is because it saves money, it's more efficient, that kind of stuff. This is the kind of thing that chief financial officers love. If you're a CEO, the kind of thing you like to do is to say, well, my company's adopting, you know, whatever the next big thing is. We're, uh, we've got chatbots. Yeah, our company has a chatbot. Um, you know, of course we have. And you might also adopt technology because it helps you deal with with new compliance regulations from, from regulators in your industry. But for most people in business, buying stuff, buying stuff up here feels very, very scary. Right? You might get fired for doing it. If any of you are old enough to remember it, there used to be a phrase in the 1950s and 60s when it came to buying computer equipment, people would say, no one ever got fired for buying IBM. <laughs> that was a huge reason why people bought from IBM. So on this picture, when you think of technology innovations, which are relatively pushing the boundary in terms of technology or relatively pushing the boundary in terms of business model, all of these are reasons why someone wouldn't buy from you. And the challenge you've got in going to market is to make your proposition seem as unscary as possible. I'm going to pick that apart in a little bit more detail. Every salesman that walks into a business trying to sell something tells a story something like this. Your company is trying to achieve its goals and you're doing pretty well. You know, things are getting steadily better. But if you buy my product, things are going to be fabulous. That's the story every salesman tells and everyone who's been in business for a while knows that actually there's a gap. <laughs> between what the salesman says is going to happen and what really happens, there's a gap here when things might go wrong. And that's critical for any business that's going to adopt your product or service. Businesses don't buy stuff like we do when we go to um, um, Harbour Front or uh, you know, Ion, wandering around in a shopping mall. Consumers tend to make decisions based on emotion. Uh, they're about me and my lifestyle. I don't, most of the time I have to buy food and I have to pay rent, but I don't have to buy a lot of clothes and things. I can always put that off until next month. Um, the things I'm buying tend to be relatively straightforward, even though, you know, compared to an electron microscope, the most sophisticated piece of technology I have in my home is quite simple. It's often one person that makes a decision or maybe two people. Um, and often it's a, a, you go to the shop, you decide you're going to buy something, or you go to the website and you, and you make the decision fairly, fairly soon. You're often buying something which is just a purchase and once it's done, it's done. There are some products like buying a washing machine. If it goes wrong, you want to know that it's going to be repaired. But nowadays you kind of expect to have to pay a repairman once it's out of warranty to do that. In a business, you've got a much more sophisticated decision process. It's not about emotion at all. It's about reducing some pain in the company, some kind of risk that they're facing. It's something that isn't being done on a whim. It's something that's being done because it has to be done. Companies don't just spend money for no reason. Um, often the things that you're buying are more complex. There are more people involved. And typically there's a long-term relationship. If I do a business with your business, if I do a, 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 a um, business with your company, I'd probably cut out all the others. An uh, interesting example of this, once I was talking to someone at um, uh, one of the hospitals here in Singapore, they were talking about those robot trolleys. I don't know if you've seen them, but there are sort of trolleys that can go around factories and places like that now and automatically find their way around the, around the hospital. And hospital adopted one of these to take drugs around to all the patients. So instead of some normal nurses walking around, it would go to each patient, it would kind of open a little door and it would give the patient their drugs and it saved the nurses some time. 
And the company that sold them that said, well, why don't you use this to deliver the food to the patients as well? You, know, you spend all this time delivering lunch. How about we do robot delivery of lunch? And the hospital said, well, that's great. The thing is, if, if the pharmacy trolley breaks down, it's relatively straightforward for one person to go around giving out the drugs. But if I have 150 ill patients and your trolley breaks down and I haven't been able to give them lunch, I've got a huge problem on my hands and all the nursing staff are going to be distracted. So I have to be incredibly sure before I bring in robot delivery of lunch around the hospital. I have to be incredibly sure that's going to work. And I have to believe that if I have a problem, you're going to be here in 10 minutes and sort it out. Otherwise, I'm not going to buy your product, however clever and smart it is, or I'm just not going to do it. So I'm going to focus a lot on risk in what I'm saying now, because ultimately, I think that's a lot of the issue that um, many of you are going to have to face as you take your products to market. I'm going to take you through a typical business to business sales process, because if you're going to go to market, you need to understand what actually happens at the end of it. The success metric is, do I make a sale? And I think it's important to understand how companies make a decision in a different way to individuals. As companies go through, typically, you could say three stages of making a sale. There are some things they're worried about, and there are some things that they're less worried about. And the things they worry about change over time. Initially, there has to be some trigger for a company to want to talk to you. There's got to be some kind of problem that they perceive. If they don't perceive there's a need to talk to you, then actually they won't even start this process. However, when they start looking for a solution, they're often not very clear about what the actual need is. And then as they get themselves more informed about the thing, then they'll actually start to say, well, okay, does this solution address our needs? And then finally, okay, I now know exactly what I want to buy. So, one of the first things that a buyer is looking for is information. They want to know what's out there in the market, what's possible, what could might not just solve my problem, but also bring some benefits. And as they go through the sales cycle, they get more and more confident. And by the end of the sales cycle, hopefully they, they believe they know what they're doing. They believe they know what they're buying. But there is an education process that has to take place through the sales cycle. Now, at the beginning, because they don't have any information, they're probably worried about cost. They're probably worried, oh, is this going to be really expensive? Can we afford it? Oh, I don't know. Oh, cost is really, really worrying. As they get more informed, actually, they may realize, oh, it's not as expensive as I thought. Or, oh, OK, I can see that there's extra benefits of this I hadn't really factored in. And so maybe, you know, ultimately, there will be a price that I have to pay for this thing. And that matters at the end of the sales cycle. I might end up deciding between two or three um, suppliers based on price. But during the sales cycle, price might become less important in the middle. What tends to dominate the decision at the end in a business to business sale is not actually price, it's risk. At the beginning, I know there's a risk involved in introducing a new innovation into my business, but I don't know how to evaluate it. As I go through this sales cycle, I get more and more confident about what I'm buying, what I need and what things cost. And ultimately, risk is probably going to be the deciding factor that dominates my decision. So as you go through your go-to-market strategy, the thing that you have to address in the mind of your buyer are these four factors. You have to address those concerns all the way through the cycle and be prepared for them, asking for different kinds of evidence and different kinds of proof as you move through the sales cycle. How do you put all that together and turn it into action? I'm going to pause again just for a second here to see whether there are any other questions. So let's go back to the chat uh, and see. Do we have anything here? We haven't. Okay, well, carry on. So what I'm going to do now is to try and spend about only 10 minutes or so, 10 or 15 minutes, uh, talking about how you put all that into practice. A lot of it will be references to other places, and we can come back and perhaps apply it to some of your businesses if you want in the next section. In order to think through how do you apply this, I want to show you one more video. Um, I wonder if any of you remember the Apple Newton. Nowadays, we all use tablets, but it wasn't at all obvious in 1993 that we'd be doing that. Oops. Let's play. It's about a lot of things, really. I think the part that excites me the most has to do with helping people keep in touch. The idea behind Newton is that it's an assistant, something that 
actively helps you as you capture, organize, and communicate your ideas and information. The possibilities are just limitless. When you think about it, the most natural way to get your thoughts down is to jot or to sketch. We wanted Newton to be that natural. Say you're on a train or a plane or at a little cafe. You can write a fax. Say you want to send that fax to Margaret. You just highlight Margaret's name in the text, tap fax. And Newton will automatically fill out a fax cover sheet with Margaret's number on it. We've built in Newton intelligence so that Newton knows enough about what you're trying to do to help you do it. The beauty of Newton is that any page you have in your Newton can be sent through email. Text, graphics, pages from your calendar, business cards. You just select email and, well, you send it. Simple as that. It seems to happen all the time these days. You're expecting a really important message, but you can't guarantee you're going to be easy to reach. By just getting the Newton messaging card, you can get your message wherever you go. You can share anything that's in your Newton with anyone else. Using Newton's built-in infrared networking capability, you can beam things to other people. It's pretty handy in meetings to just be able to send someone something instantly. Your business card or the notes or a calendar page. You can even jot notes to jog your memory later or set an alarm. Or add a task to your to-do list. Kind of a communication center or a universal inbox and outbox. The Newton Connection Kit lets you connect your Newton to your PC or your Macintosh and share and store information. This is all about being in charge of your life, being able to have information so you can keep in touch with people. It's going to help you keep track of your time and your contacts, but it's going to do it in a way that's not intrusive to your lifestyle. I'd say that Newton is really peace of mind, right in the palm of your hand. So for anyone that doesn't know, the Apple Newton completely bombed. Um, it was it was a total failure. It was one of the it was probably one of uh, Steve Jobs' most heroic uh, failures. Of course, long term, you know, the the iPhone came out in what was it, 2007. Um, so 14 years later, he had a second go at these kinds of use cases. And by that time, people were used to mobile devices. They were used to off, always on connectivity. But you've probably seen in that advert that there's a whole blurred kind of rojack of applications and benefits and kind of stuff. And he's trying to sell you this, all these things which were very unfamiliar at the time. The idea of beaming information instantly to somebody, you know, and having to click on a load of things to do it. Well, you could just hand over a business card. So why would you want to do that? Having to carry around kind of clunky extra things that you plug in so that you get remote connectivity. This is all before Wi-Fi, of course. Why would you want to do that? You know, that just wasn't obvious. And then some of the situations they show in that video, there's a guy sitting by the side of a river as a couple goes past in a boat. You know, I remember back in the early 1990s, it wasn't at all obvious. If you went out to be in nature to sit by a river, you don't want to have your office in touch with you at that time. Nowadays, of course, personal life and business life have been blurred together, but it was not obvious, even in 1993, that people would want to do that. So the Apple Newton completely bombed. Of course, the technology didn't work very well either. I mean, the, the, the stylus thing was horrible. Everyone lost those styluses all the time. Um, but I think it's very interesting that this was a, a visionary product where there was no need. So that word vision is in there. And of course, Steve Jobs is somebody that we associate with vision. This is what the academics would call an innovation framework. It's the traditional way that many people in companies would think about innovation. They would say, you come up with lots of ideas, you score them and identify them and you know you hire a load of engineers and then you hire a bunch of salespeople and you launch them into the world and that part of the process is often called the kind of go-to-market strategy i've got my idea now i take it to market that's a very traditional vision driven approach and it's very typical of technologists technologists often think of this i have a brilliant idea which you little people out there at home don't understand how brilliant it is and how it's going to change your lives if only you could share my vision you could achieve the benefits that i'm going to tell you about it turns out that this fails an enormous amount of the time 70 to 80 percent of innovations which are done this way fail startups which are done this way and a discovery-based approach also fail a lot of the time, but they do it much quicker and a lot cheaper, which means everyone can move on to the next big thing. The startup concept instead is launch an idea, measure whether it's achieving any traction with the, with the market, learn from what works and what doesn't work, and go around that learning cycle as fast as you possibly can. It's like pivoting like this to get towards 
the solution that ultimately you want. And that's where all of those techniques like Lean Startup Design Thinking Agile come from. A kind of extreme example of that would be this product, Mailey.com. Um, my son was about six years old when I saw this advert, Mailey, your kid's first email. He was nagging me to have email because he could see that you know, his mum and I both used email a lot. And this was like a kind of graphical thing that you, that you could use. Um, I downloaded it. Uh, it was completely crap. It didn't work. And it had a giant green sticker in the top side of the corner at the time. And it said, click this sticker to give us feedback. So I banged the sticker and said, guys, this is a great idea, but it doesn't work. How come? Two hours later, I got an email back from the developers in Spain saying, we came up with this idea on Wednesday. We launched it on Saturday. 10,000 people have downloaded it. So now we know they care. Which of the following five features do you think we should prioritize? <laughs> So Meili had launched a piece of vaporware, smoke and mirrors product that didn't actually exist. And they were testing, is there any demand for this? Absolutely brilliant lean startup strategy. Except that it doesn't always work. Here are some examples of innovations which have you know, had a big impact on the world and which um, didn't come from startups and were not done that way. The transistor took decades of work at Bell Laboratories and it was developed absolutely with a vision of what was possible. Plastic surgery, you can't just launch a kind of a, you know, a new plastic surgery technology and say, hey, guys, um, I, you know, let's have a go on your face. This is my minimum viable surgery. Oh, sorry, it messed up. I'll give you a discount off version 2.0 in a year's time. You know, it doesn't work like that. And, and then there are technologies like nylon. Here are some fabulous pajamas from the 1960s. Um, nylon was a technology developed by DuPont in huge chemical laboratories and it was developed over decades again. Artificial fibers are a classic example of a technology that absolutely did not come from a startup. They were part of an enormous manufacturing process. And none of these things, all of which in their own ways have changed our lives, none of those things were developed through discovery-based innovation. All of these things were go-to-market products. They started with a vision and then they went to market. This product here started with a little bit of a vision, but mainly went out to the market and then created technology that the market wanted. So, which of these two questions comes first? Is it the question, could it be done? Or is it the question, should it be done? I think going back to our three horizons again, you can see where those two questions go. The question about technology from very experimental to today, obviously if you can buy this, the technology in SimLim, it can be done. If it's something that everyone's got, then it should be done, clearly. Is it something that you should do if everyone's doing it? Well, that's another question. You've got to have a real advantage if you're going to go into a crowded marketplace. But I think you can see these two questions on that diagram. And I think that leads to an interesting discussion, which is should you have a go-to-market strategy at all? If you're a traditional kind of technology market, you would prove the technology by investing money and doing proof of concept, proof of value. This is the kind of things that our colleagues at ASTAR do a lot of. And then finally, you would prove a business case. You'd license it to somebody, by which time you spent millions of dollars on it and you discover that nobody wants it. No criticism of ASTAR there. It's, the, it's, the, it's a problem with that approach of going to market. My own view is that in every situation, it is always best to answer, could it be done as well as should it be done at the same time? If you're investing too much energy in the could it be done question, you may not be answering a really critical question, which is, should it be done? Will there be a business at the end of this? So what makes success, um, should it be done, comes down to connecting really with, I think, four different groups of stakeholders. Obviously, there are customers and there are people that might connect you to customers, distributing distribution channels. But especially if you're doing a deep technology product, you're also going to have to recruit talented people and they can move around. They can go to other companies. If you want the best talent, you've got to connect with them as well. You're selling to talent in the same way that you're selling to customers, but you're selling something different. Here you're selling a product or a service. Here you're selling a job opportunity. When you're selling to investors and financial people, you're not selling a product. You're not selling a career opportunity. You're selling a return on their money. And when you're selling something to regulators who have the power to say yes or no, you can do your business, you're selling to them to say, I have a safe technology which is going to provide public benefit. So I think for each of those stakeholders, you can say that there are different ways of defining what you are selling, how you have to go to market, but the same strategy is going to have the same, the, the go to market strategy is going to have to span all of these different four dimensions. 
So I'm just going to dive into those very briefly. And if you want more information, I can, I can give you references afterwards. These are some of the ways that you might connect with each of these parts of your market, if you like, each of these different areas that you have to communicate with. You remember that the things we have to assure each of these are we have to give them information. We have to help them understand the value for money, the cost price thing. We have to uh, help them understand how it relates to their need and why it's a solution that's relevant to them. And we have to take away risk. If I'm selling my company to a talented person who could join a large business, because they could go and work for Google or they could come and work for my startup, I've got to sell them on all of those things. There's a sales process to get them on board. Yeah? So I'm not going to dive into this in detail, but just so that you know, I think I'll probably bring this to a swift end now. I will say that there is a template that we've developed with ASTAR and with, it's an evolving process. If anyone wants to go through a process of trying to map out a go-to-market strategy, we've got a formula, a template for you to try and describe your business in a very short form. We've got a series of um, things that you might want to fill in to understand how your um, business relates to its market, in particular how it's got a business model developing. We've given you some pointers to how to understand how that market might, might be changing over the short, to medium and long term. And in particular, we've asked you to focus on exactly who are you going to reach to try to sell to? Because a go-to-market strategy has got to be focused on the person you want to go to. It's not good enough to say, oh, I'm going to sell to car manufacturers or beauty spas. You need to know exactly what kind of person you're trying to connect with and how you're going to get to them. You need to create messages for each of those four groups of stakeholders. And you need to think about the way that those messages are going to get through to those stakeholders. All of that really is marketing, and it's something that I covered in another talk recently um, called uh, 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 um, Get Presentable. Uh, I'll, I, again, we can send you links to that for anyone that's interested. But I think a really critical thing for most business-to-business -business companies is that you start to create a strategy which thinks of your stakeholders as people that you're pulling in down a funnel. You need to take them through a series of stages where you acquire the customer, you get some interest in what you're doing, you engage with them, you try and sell them something which generates revenue. You'll know that things are working if they're staying with you, and you'll really know that things are working if they're recommending their friends to you. And finally, I would urge you, as you think about a go-to-market strategy, especially if you're a deep technology company, to think about resourcing this properly. Going to market is not something that is something, you know, a lot of the companies trying to tell you tools online, you know, instant um, explainer video creator type things and all that sort of stuff. They'll all tell you that you can kind of do this for $5 a month and the job's done. It's not. The actual tools, the production of marketing materials is the easy part. It's getting the message right and getting that message to the right people that's really challenging. Again, this isn't really a talk about marketing. It's a talk about go-to-market strategy. So I'm going to leave it at that point. Um, I'll come back to questions and answers and just leave you on the screen with some uh, books that people might find interesting to follow up with. I'm going to pull up the uh, questions now to see if we've got any more that have, have come in. Uh, and uh, I can see, I think there might be one. Um, from Eunice, uh, thank you, thank you very much, Eunice. Uh, above the honesty, we're going to be what's the most important thing you pick? Action, idea, beachhead market. I think it's picking the right beachhead market, to be perfectly honest. If you understand where you're trying to focus your energy, you know, the, you know, the, the hardest thing for a startup is that you've got a limited amount of time before you run out of money, before the team starts falling apart and people start taking other jobs or going to consulting jobs or whatever. You need to pick a beachhead market where you can make impact and build confidence amongst yourselves and amongst all your other stakeholders. Uh, what's my favorite product? I've always been fascinated by the telephone. It's funny, as a kid, and it might sound really bizarre now, but uh, as a kid, we, you know, one of the few technologies we had in the house was a, a dial telephone. Um, and I was fascinated by how it was possible to talk to people at a distance. And uh, I think at one time, I thought I wanted to work for a telephone company. So that's my favorite technology. Thank you for those questions. Are there any others? I'll throw it open now. 
please do feel free to go on speech. Um, I think uh, uh, Ivan's questions are, uh, you have an answer to him. Yeah. Ah, okay, so Ivan, thank you very much. Any particular fact to go on? Hiring talent, right, yes, absolutely. Um, staff has gone, absolutely. Thank you, thank you for reminding me, Winnie. So if you're in the startup phase, you've got to project a vision <laughs> because you've got nothing else. When you're trying to attract technical talent to a startup that's in the startup phase, there's got to be something in it for the technologists. You know, a lot of the time people will say, oh, I've got an idea for a business, but I haven't got a chief technology officer. Well, that's a bit like saying, I want to start a rock band, uh, but I don't know how to play the guitar. You need to hire, you know, if someone's going to come to you and bring their hard won talent to you, they need to believe that there's something in it for them, that there's something interesting. Of course, you can hire people if you've got the money to do it. But the startup phase, you need to create alignment between a small number of people where everyone is getting something out of the experience. And you might know that the kind of stereotypical makeup of a startup team is a, a hipster, a hustler, and a hacker. So a hipster, someone that designs and understands user experience. Um, a hacker, somebody that understands the technology in whatever domain you're in and a hustler, someone that can sell. If you have a small startup team, it's relatively easy to keep everyone aligned. If the team gets bigger, as the team gets bigger, it gets harder and harder to make sure that everyone's getting something out of it beyond just being paid to do a job. And of course, if you're doing a startup, they're not gonna get paid very much. So in the startup phase, it's all about understanding people's personal motivations and trying to think, well, that's great. Does your personal motivation align with the market? For example, if you've got a technologist who really, really wants to do some amazingly clever technology, which might win a Nobel Prize years down the line, that's a different agenda to building a business. And you have to ask yourself, are we really aligned? During the scale-up phase, when you're hiring, um, when you're hiring people, uh, I think it's easier to um, attract uh, more established talent because there's more money to pay people. It's easier to tell people what their role is going to be. It's easier for everyone to visualize that they're joining you know, a train which is going somewhere rather than a train which is revving its wheels at the station and hasn't actually started moving yet. So when you're in a scale-up phase, you've got all the excitement and the numbers and the press coverage and everything else to prove to talent that you're going somewhere. And for a lot of people who are more risk averse, again, that seems like a much less risky option. It's easier to sell to your parents to say, hey, I'm joining you know, this really successful scale up that you've just read about in the Business Times. That's a much easier sell to your parents than it is to say, hey, I'm joining this startup that my friend's beginning and it, we don't have any customers and we don't have any money. So I hope that answers that question, Ivan. Um, any other questions that we've got there? Any more questions from the audience? Well, perhaps we should say um, thanks very much in that case for coming along. I really appreciate uh, uh, Yonkit and Winnie. Thank you for all your efforts setting this up. Thank you for everybody who's joined us. Um, if you want to ask anything privately, um, my email's in the, uh, within the presentation and um, the, 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 the PDF is available. I'll post it on SlideShare this morning um, and I'll also put it on, on, on YouTube um, under JFDI's channel there. So um, it should be available for download very soon. Perhaps if I send links to both of those things, um, Winnie and Yonkit might want to distribute it to anyone that's interested. Thanks, you for the very productive sessions and very useful information today. I'm sure these will be beneficial to our companies here. So the, the slide that just now presented, uh, Hugh has already sent it to us, so we will disseminate to everyone here today. Great, great. Fantastic. Yeah. All right. Take care, everybody. Thank you very much, Hugh. Uh, and Thank Ivan's you. asked about the marketing action plan. Um, do you have access to that, Winnie, or, or is that something that uh, I think... Uh, yeah, I will disseminate to everyone here. Very yeah, good. Your email. All right. Bye-bye, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Hugh. Bye.